Hello everyone, this is Brian Chittister, the author of Out of My Head, The Imaginary Creatures of Josip Bakke, and this video is a special glimpse into six outtake pages that didn't make it into the book, basically because of a timing situation. The Lil Art Museum, or otherwise known as the Lille Metropole Musée du Art Moderne, has in their collection six pages by Bakke that were not numbered or included in his bestiary and I only had access to them after the book was printed. So I thought as sort of a bonus track that I would do a review of them, sort of a video essay, so that you could gain further access into Bakke's creative universe. We know because the work was kept hidden for Bakke's entire life and even after his death that we were never supposed to see this world and that it was something that was unveiled to the world long after his death. But again, the works that we're going to talk about now did not make it into the book. So starting with the first page, we can see that it's not the same size as the regular pages in the bestiary. It seems to be have been cut or trimmed along the sides. Instead of two boxes along the bottom, there's three hand-drawn boxes by Bakke. I should say that the original pages in the numbered bestiary are all basically five inches by ten inches and because of the research that I did I was able to discover that on the backs of most of the pages there was a watermark that said Policia de Barcelona which means that they were basically blank parking tickets and he probably pilfered the pages before they had any stamps on them or anything and took them home and drew on them. So for this first page we see that it's more or less in the style of book number one, there are nine books in the bestiary, and the first book is kind of a hodgepodge of you know, different varieties of creatures. And from books two through nine, he got basically more focused on individual types or species like bats and spiders and crustaceans and cuttlefish and things like that. But for the first book, which is, takes up almost half of the bestiary, he sort of focused on a lot of different varieties of creatures. In the case of this one, you have three horned creatures. They're all facing outward. They all have seemingly somewhat of a primitive men feeling to them. The first one has webbed fingers and um, claw feet, is covered in hair, has exposed breasts, a pair of ram's horns, and a face that looks somewhere between an animal and a tiki god with long teeth and maybe iguana eyes and a duck bill. So here already you see him hybridizing in the way that he would almost throughout the bestiary. You can detect kind of the root animals that he was working in but it's not really clear whether they were pre-thought out or whether this was something that happened sort of spontaneously. I really like the stipple effect that he used for the hair. It's a very tight brush. And it's hard to say when you zoom in whether the brush or the, the stipple effect was actually done with a, a fine brush or whether it was pencil or whether it was pen or a combination of both. The one in the middle also has the same kind of hand-drawn dot pattern effect for its skin and hair. It also has horns much more ram-like where they curl kind of a, almost like a beehive on the top of its head, like a literal beehive, with this kind of squared patterning on the upper part of his face and the breast area and his hands and feet. To the right, you have another sort of ram, pan, or maybe Lucifer-like character. I love the starred eyes and the pink ears and breast plate and inside of the arms you can actually see that he's sort of mimicking anatomy in that way and then scaly skin on the sides and the top of the arms and one would assume the back he has hair as well these ones like the ones in the bestiary have expressive looks on their face but they actually look kind of almost not like caricatures and we don't really know why he would not have put these in with the numbered creatures that's kind of a, a mystery about not only these, but the other outtake pages that have been discovered. 
We don't know if they didn't reach the level of imagination that he wanted or whether they didn't have the same type of expression or maybe he was just experimenting around or maybe he had already completed the bestiary and moved on or maybe these ones actually predate the bestiary. It's really hard to say. The electric colors of the one to the right and the maturity of the design suggest that they, they were later additions or later drawings after he had finished his project, but again, we can't really say for sure. For the second page, again, the color variety is pretty incredible. In the center we have one that, you know, it has incredible hybridity. You have crab-like claws, you have the legs of a satyr or goat's legs. In the middle it's really hard to say what kind of hybridity is happening there at all, and in a way it looks patterned or plastic. And the face also looks very pan-like or goat-like, but with antlers. The one to the left is very reminiscent to me of the creatures in book number one. And in this case, he looks sort of like a kangaroo creature. The body, whether that's rolls or um, kind of a larvae makeup, takes on the form of of a hybrid creature in that it has hooves on his hands and feet and is bipedal. Again, if it is a larvae body, um, he's being pretty playful with it. And the one to the right is very totem-like in its face. Um, I love all the patterning and differentiation of color and the third eye in the middle, as well as the sort of buffalo-looking uh, nose. Um, but then for the body, you have definitely a reptile's body there, or at least reptile scales with the pudginess of maybe like a hippopotamus or like a much uh, larger beast. He's not a quadruped in that he's not down on all four. So, And also the tail between his legs and the breasts sort of suggests maybe some level of androgyny. For the third page here, we have one that is very playful. Unlike the first two pages in this smaller outtake collection where the creatures don't really acknowledge each other, they more look out at us or look inward. This one definitely has the two creatures to the right very much aware of each other. The one to the far right has crab or lobster claws at the top of its head and a ghastly look on its face and you know octopus suctions and a dragon's tail. And then the one looking at it has a strange kind of like a rooster's mane and a scared look with the tongue sticking out and the body of one of Bakke's serpents or snakes, but there's feet at the bottom. So again, you know, he's extremely playful and seems to have this sort of mastery of anatomy in that he can do whatever he wants with it, can be as surreal as he wants, and can um, blend forms that aren't true to nature with ease. The one to the far left is also kind of an octopus squid character, but he seems to have kind of a tiger's or a lion's face with that claw sticking out of the top and the two spikes out of the side and suction cuffs, and is a cyclops. So you can see not only references to nature but also to mythological creatures and the cyclops and the lion. So this is one of the things that was a big question mark in my essays in the book was whether you know, Bakke based some of his creatures on mythology or on fairy tales and then extracted them from their narrative setting so as to give them the feeling of being a part of a phylum but also then playing with that idea of natural history or framing things up as part of a phylum or species and instead you know allowing them to have individuated personality they're they're isolated one of the things here is that they're not isolated as far as like being boxed off in their own box on this page they they still have again the lines at the bottom where he could describe them which he also here left blank but they're not segregated off into their own box so you could actually almost imagine that the, at least the two to the right actually being in a somewhat of a narrative situation or a situation where they were actually on facing off in a you know in a blank landscape 
Page four, these are definite primitive men or beasts, and the one to the far left, the, the, the pink sort of ogre looking character with the long nose and the, the hair on the side of his face, has a strong feeling of being a caricature or maybe somebody that he saw while he was doing his rounds as a police officer. These kind of facial types that he saw all around him, I believe were something that he integrated into his imaginary creatures. He, he took the emotion and the body language of their self-presentation and anthropomorphized them. The one in the middle has an Audi belly button, a playful little tail that slithers around its leg in the back. Now, honestly, the belly button looks a little bit like maybe a penis, and then it has breaths, so again, pointing to kind of the um, androgyny of so many of his creatures. There's also this kind of hanging cheek that is reminiscent of an orangutan, as well as the hairy legs and hairy forearms. And then you also have this kind of plate-like feature along his shoulders and back that is somewhat reminiscent of, say, an armadillo. The one to the right, I really like its feet and hands. It kind of makes me think of like Maurice Sendak's Wild Things. But I really like that kind of neo-Gothic, kind of German miniature aspect of the hands. Sometimes Bakke is extremely detailed and at other times he is a little bit more ham-fisted in the kind of way that most outsider artists are. And of course he wasn't a part of the outsider or art group genre. He wasn't, you know, as far as I know, a member of the surrealist movement. So it's really questionable where his techniques came from, but it does seem like he saw a lot of different things and maybe experimented with them during his time leading up to these creatures and certainly as he was working on them. Page five, these two are definitely in some sort of communication and again, unlike the numbered pages of the bestiary, these two are not corrugated off even though they're against a blank backdrop and have the, the blank boxes underneath them. The one to the left is reminiscent of some other sort of checkerboarded or pied patterned creatures in the bestiary. Again, both of them have horns. The one to the right looks a little bit almost like a jester hat, you know, with the, the bell on the top and it's two little fruit-like protrusions hanging off its neck and goatee and, the, you know, the, the way that the hair around his ears kind of gives it a feeling of a caricature, but he, he definitely has this dragon-like neck with all the spikes on it and the tail. You have an interesting body with a pot belly and breasts and, you know, ogre-like feet. The way in which they're looking at each other, the one to the left has its hands out almost sort of questioning or inviting or conversing and you and you can see his teeth as though he's talking and the one to the right is listening very intently like a sort of a wise old sage. The face also reminds me of like a caricature of a turtle's face or something like out of the never-ending story. The coloring here is very reminiscent of the early coloring of the books. It's a little bit more muted in pattern but again like in the book you can see that he seems to have used the same color palette across the page and so you know the blue of the spiked hair on the one to the right just above his ears is also the blue that's used for the back of the eyeballs and the creature to the left and the purple is definitely similar and the browns of the long neck and the jester hat on the creature to the right is the same color kind of orangish brown as the horns in the back of the creature to the left moving on to the sixth and final page we have one to the left that has this Germanic wild man like texture to his arms and his hands. This is something that was in a number of the creatures in the first book of the bestiary which also makes me think again that these creatures were probably done in the early times. It's just some of these techniques that while they do show up sometimes later they're really prominent in the beginning also, these tiki or totem-like faces are really common to the opening book of the bestiary. This is one who you just can't even imagine how its anatomy would function in nature. And I think that's one of the things that 
Bakke did extremely well is portray things that had no actual function in nature or you couldn't actually imagine them evolving with any purpose so that their purpose becomes expressionist only and so therefore he as somebody who's having this kind of intimate creative relationship with his creation is reducing to pure emotion their strangeness and their lack of functionality is what gives them their ability to be communicative above all. The two to the right are a little bit more in the kind of ham-fisted style, um, a little bit more blocky and a little less fluid. They look, they, they look like they're less likely to move. Um, I like the, the mohawk of the one in the middle and the kind of wild look on its face. It's got these flippers or webbed feet with this mammal's body and so somewhere between the wolfman and the creature from the black lagoon which i'm highly doubting that he knew of either at that time but he did seem to have an interest in weird reptile like creatures that kind of somehow seemed to have a, an aesthetic affinity with the creature from the black lagoon or hp lovecraft's dagon and again i think that's probably just a, a you know sort of an affinity of minds playing out rather than a direct reference because we don't know that Baki had any um, knowledge of either of those characters and the one to the right has kind of a yak look to it or maybe like a yak mixed with an orangutan and <laughs> um, again it's, not, it's almost kind of um, striped stockings for the lower half of its legs and Paul's another really cool hybrid and again for all these creatures he used some pretty fine pens or brush strokes or probably a mixture of both to get the patterning they weren't um, these ones weren't as pied or checkered or Byzantine influenced as some of the other ones the, these are the ones that have this intricate little detail that's all I can think of for now without doing a, an exact comparison to creatures within the bestiary itself. It's really hard to say with any exactitude where these fit in the timeline and again why he discarded them or didn't use them for the bestiary itself. I think the best we can say is that they have a stylistic similarity in my opinion to the ones at the beginning of the book or at the beginning of the bestiary. But again the, the techniques sort of ran throughout and whether he didn't use these or discarded these because they weren't up to the level of the creatures in the bestiary or he had some sort of grand design that we don't know about or whether these were just experiments or things that he did after the project had finished it's impossible to say but in my opinion they are every bit as intricate and expressionist as anything else in the bestiary and so I'm really glad that we at least had the opportunity to present them in this video if not in the book itself and again I want to thank the Lille Art Museum or the Lille Metropole Musée du Art Moderne and Nicholas DeWitt for allowing us to use these. Hope everybody's enjoying the book and I hope this extra dive into the weird world cosmos of Josip Bakke was an enjoyable one. Okay, take care.